We're going to kick things off on a real official high note. Um, first up, I'd like to introduce a former guest of ours at one of our first panelists at our writers panel back in early March, back when this was just getting started. Uh, she wrote Set It Up. If I don't know if you've any, any of you have seen that, but it's great. Uh, please welcome Katie Silberman. And next up, you, you may know her as an actor, producer, activist, but now she is a director. Please welcome Olivia Wilde. Thank you. This is awesome. What? <laughs> it's opening night of the Women in Entertainment Summit. Summit. It sounds like you guys have a lot of awesome things coming, so this is really cool that we get to kick it off. We're very, very happy to be here. Um, Booksmart is something that has been a big part of our lives for almost two years. Feels like 150, but Does two indeed. years. <laughs> and now we get to make it a part of yours. So thank you for coming. This is something that we hope makes you feel good and makes you laugh. Um, we made this movie as a love letter to your generation, to be honest. Um, and a generation that we feel is a lot cooler than ours, so... <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, we made it also because we love movies like Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Breakfast Club. Dazed and Confused. Dazed and Confused, Clueless. Heard of them? I hope so, because there's a lot of references to them in the movie. Um, but no, honestly, we're going to come back for a Q&A. Yes, we'll be back. We'll be back. We just want to say thank you for coming. We're so excited. We're really, really happy. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hello. Hello. Hi. You didn't get the benefit of walking to the music, but yeah. it's killer. It's a killer runway track. <laughs> um, something I was thinking about, this is my second time that I saw it tonight. First of all, what do you guys think? <laughs> so why are fights with your best girlfriend so much more like a sucker punch? Like, it's so hot. When you fight with your best friend, yeah. it's a tough, tough thing. And you guys really captured that in this film. Well, we talked a lot about that because, you know, something that seems to be really difficult for young women in friendships is expressing uh, anger and disappointment. <laughs> we, almost like women at a young age are very, very good at expressing love. It's so much admiration. It's like, I love you. You're so beautiful. You're so brilliant. You're the Blind best Blind me with your I beauty. I love you so fucking much. But... It's harder to be like, I hate when you speak to me that way, or I don't want to go with you to that thing. That feels, for some reason, like betrayal. And it's almost, I think, and this is a huge generalization, but it seems to be almost easier for young men to express negative feelings and harder for them to be like, I love you, you're handsome. You're amazing. Blind me with your beauty. You blind me with your beauty. <laughs> but it's easier to be like, oh, I hate that man. Oh, shut up. I don't want to come with you to that thing. So we talked a lot about how because these girls haven't ever reached a point where they've acknowledged their sort of separate identities and that they haven't really acknowledged that there's this kind of fissure that's obviously growing because they are going to separate places that it builds, the pressure builds, and explodes into that really massive fight that is kind of traumatizing for them and us every time we watch it. <laughs> and also that you're, we talked a lot about how your best friend, especially your high school best friend, is really like your first soulmate. Like that connection is so intense and so intimate and you're as open with them as you are with anyone. And when you've been that intimate and open with someone, they know the thing that will hurt you the most. And I think that's why those very rare fights you have with those friends, they know exactly what to say that will kind of like literally make the sound drop out because it, it hurts your heart so much. I'm still afraid to fight with my best girlfriend from high school. Like she knows some. She knows mm. it all. She knows it all. <laughs> Uh, so this script has, I don't know if everybody knows this, this script has been around for like over a decade. And then when you guys, like... 2009. 2009. Yeah. So you guys updated it, because this feels incredibly modern and fresh. So can you talk a little bit about making this film feel so 2019, especially for this younger generation? Yeah. Um, it was really easy. Um, <laughs> no, it was, well, when I, when I came on, I had known about the script for a long time, too, because it had been around since 2009, and there are sometimes ideas, I think, in Hollywood that everyone 
is really excited about, and it goes through different iterations as they're waiting to make the best version of it. And so there were kind of three different iterations of this script and this story that were all about the same core idea, which is two really smart best friends in high school that kind of adapted and evolved with the time in, in terms of even kind of like what Hollywood was ready to say when they were making a movie about smart young women. And when I came on, I heard that it was with Anna Perna and Gloria Sanchez and Olivia Wilde was attached to direct and they were looking to kind of reimagine that core idea. And also when you hear those three names, you're like, arrest me and take me to jail. I'll do literally anything to work with them. <laughs> and so, but it was, it was so extraordinary because Olivia, who is just the most impressive director I've ever worked with, had this vision and this tone already. She knew exactly what kind of movie she was gonna make and she talked about the generational anthems that we talked about earlier, like Days and Confused and Clueless and Fast Times and those movies are very timely. Like they're really specific about the generation that they are about and what it's like to be a teenager in that year. But they're really timeless in terms of kind of like the characters and the arcs and the stories that you think about. And so the challenge that way was to say, like, what is a story we could tell that's representative of this generation, which is smarter and cooler and more progressive and more brave than so many other generations while still coming up with a new angle on that story that feels timeless. And the opportunity to tell a story about really smart young women who their brilliance is kind of one aspect of their personalities instead of the defining aspect of their personalities, which a lot of stories, I think if there's a smart girl, you know she's smart and you don't know very much about her. And the really smart women in my life are also like very irresponsible and wild and fun and funny and a lot of other things and they just happen to be doing these incredible things, like now they're doctors. And sometimes I'm like, do your patients know what I know that you use, <laughs> how you used to behave? But so that was, it felt like that was the way to make it 2019, other than kind of like the, the more general things of just how, how progressive and diverse everyone was and the ability to reflect what it feels like reality looks like in terms of like the group of people that the story was about, was about showing those smart young women in a way that we hadn't seen before. Which also, when you have Beanie and Caitlin in this cast, is the easiest thing in the entire world. We had uh, we we really welcomed the input of the cast as, in order to make it maintain the authenticity. You know, we really looked to them to help us keep ourselves and the movie honest. You know, Victoria Ruesca, who plays Ryan, she had never acted before. She's a pro skater. She's from North Hollywood. I was looking for a, a, a an actress to play Ryan who could skate. And I had all these girls coming into the audition who, bless their hearts, were like holding a skateboard that they had clearly never held before. And I was like, oh no. And we were looking at all these girls and it was really hard. We weren't finding the right, finding the right Ryan. And then our casting director, Allison Jones, who had cast mid 90s, and she's just the best casting director in the business. I said, are there any women, any actresses you met while doing mid 90s that you could recommend? And she's like, well, let's call the guy who kind of is the head of that skate crew. So she called this guy Mikey, and she's like, are there any girls? And he's like, there is a girl, and she is the coolest, and her name's Victoria. I'll see if she'll come in. And in walked the most glorious <laughs> person who was so real and so kind of uh, just luminous. And I knew the moment I saw her, I was like, that's it. That's Ryan. And she kept kind of for you know, making the script her own, and this is an example of what everyone in the cast did, and I think what made it feel kind of current, is they brought their own essence into the role. And I kept saying to them, please, tell us if something doesn't feel completely natural. Tell us if you can make it feel more honest about your generation. And she just kept saying, hey Liv, do I have to say it like this? Like, look at the script, and I was like, nope. <laughs> How do you want to see it? She's like, I'll just put it in my own words. I was like, yes, please. So she's also wearing all her own clothes because I was like, I like your clothes better than all the clothes we bought. Um, <laughs> but I just think that's part of it is we really allowed the cast to own the movie and I think that's part of what makes it feel authentic. And it really doesn't, you know, so many movies that are aimed at a teen audience, they take themes like sexuality and gender and body image and they just hammer home these messages and it's just, it's too obvious, it's too much. And what's really interesting about your direction and your script is that you kind of rise above the obvious and you allow the characters to be these full characters. And it's not just that this is the character that's the lesbian and this is the character that's, like, they, these women have full lives, each character. And I know that your cast really appreciated that as well, but can you talk about kind of veering away from the more obvious themes that a lot of films kind of get caught in? Well, I mean, I think we just wanted to go in deep right to the core of 
those kind of existential crises that make adolescence really complicated and, and confusing and hard and also exciting. You know, I think a lot of movies that settle for stories that are about, you know, oh, she she wants, she has a crush on the guy and wants to go to the party or she they need to assimilate and hide their identity so they can fit in. All of those issues are kind of more surface level. That's like symptoms of the lar the deeper questions. That it's like, who am I? And 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 have I been seen? And am I able to see other people? So I think we just wanted to go directly to those core questions of like, who am I in this world? And am I worth being here? Which is something that you deal with in adolescence and for the rest of your life. And what the movie asks you to acknowledge is that you are several different things. And so is everyone else. And stop putting other people into categories. Because if you're doing that, then you're doing it to yourself. And you're just holding yourself back. Um, how autobiographical is this film for you two? <laughs> well, the dolls. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what was so fun about developing the script and, and collaborating with Olivia from kind of the base idea of the story was that it was autobiographical in that we wanted to reflect authentic female friendship and how... Uh, as you were saying before, like truly loving that can be and, and that kind of powerful, how powerful having a friend like that can make you feel in terms of how much they inspire you and how to kind of honor the real women in our lives who are our friends who are that multidimensional and who are so many of those things at once. And, and, and Beanie has talked about this very articulately too, that which is that you know, everyone at school sees Molly as one thing and Amy is the only person who sees her as many things because she's her best friend that way. And your best friends are kind of the, the first person to see all your different dimensions and the multi-dimensionality. And so I think that is, is on a macro level what we were hoping to kind of infuse. And then in general, kind of just like a lot of specifics about our real friends and people that we went to high school with. It was fun to infuse as many because the specifics of high school can end up feeling very universal. Like I feel like everyone has a Gigi and... <laughs> Gigi's named after my Gigi. <laughs> She's out there. She knows. She's she knows too, that now Gigi's in the movie, so I'm very scared. <laughs> she like rises up from above. <laughs> She's in the corner. Yeah. Uh, so, Olivia, this is your directorial debut, which is incredible. Which is crazy. <laughs> now, I don't know if you guys know this, but she's also a very acclaimed music video director. She has directed a Red Hot Chili Peppers music video and an Edward Sharp video. Um, but I want to know, like, uh, taking your talents to film, on this film in particular, like, when did you start to, like, feel like you were in the groove of director? Like, you could, like, own it and just your, your confidence level was just, like, at a I, 10. I... It's uh, a 10, I mean, I don't know. I, I think that, you know, we worked really hard in pre-production because we knew we didn't have enough shooting days for this movie. We had 26 days to shoot the entire thing. Yeah. And so we knew we had to basically make the movie in pre-production. And so we worked really hard to be as specific as possible in our plan. And I remember being on, I think, my second location scout with the crew, and I had the cinematographer, Jason McCormick, who's obviously incredible. Our uh, first AD, Scott Robertson, who had come off of working w with In Your Ritu on The Revenant, which was great, because anytime things went, anytime things got a little stressful on our set, I was like, but it's better than The Revenant, right? <laughs> he was like, yes. But I, I do, I think it was during the scouts that I realized, like, oh, I'm comfortable, um, I'm comfortable giving direction here and establishing what this movie's gonna look and feel like because I see it in my head. And I think what crews are looking for, and indeed actors as well, is someone who's specific and confident in their vision. And this is a movie that I had in my head from jump. I mean, when I pitched to Annapurna, I could see it in my head. I knew exactly, you know, I, I could feel it. Now, the specifics of it and what it became was ever evolving because then, you know, when Katie came on board and it just got so much better and so much funnier and so much more interesting to me and everyone else, then the vision kept evolving. But I could see it. And I think your confidence as a director really has to come from you knowing the story. So that no matter what happens, you could lose every location. It doesn't matter because you have a different way to tell the story because you just know it. And... I think it was on that scout where people were like, how about this apartment building? And I was like, no, that's wrong. It's obviously wrong. And I was like, oh, because I see the right version. And when we saw the right one, I knew it. Um, 
And then there were moments throughout the filming where I was like, okay, like there was one night, the night we did the pool scene, we had three simultaneous units running and I was running back and forth between them and I was like, okay, I feel like I've earned my director card tonight. <laughs> the DGA can officially induct me based on tonight. But um, I don't know, you know, honestly, this sounds kind of corny, but I have a, a five-year-old son, Otis, who the other day I said to him, Otis, do you know what I do for a living? So you never know if your kids get it. And he looked at me and he's like, yeah, mom, you're a director. And I was like, oh, am I? And then that was the first time that I hit that level 10, like, I think I could be. So I don't know. Um, I'm sure that there's a lot of people here who are wondering, who were you in high school, both of you? How would you describe yourselves in high school? I, I mean, what's fun is that I think when you're like part of making a movie, you see a little bit of yourself in everyone. We've been talking about it in terms of astrology. So I've been saying that I'm a Molly under an Amy Moon with a Jared rising. Because <laughs> I think there's like a little bit. So accurate. <laughs> so perfect. Um, I, I think that's as close as I can get to it. It's been fun to talk to my friends from high school and see who they thought they were versus who I thought they were. Because yeah. I think sometimes that's not the same. But Yeah. I, I was all of these people, and I think what frustrated me in high school is that people kept trying to figure out which box to put me in, and I didn't fit in those boxes, and it made them annoyed. Like, I went to a, a boarding school that was very, um, it was very competitive academically, you know, like here, and it was a place where everybody fit into a category. Indeed, there were dining halls where each dining hall had a personality. And I remember going on my first tour there, and they're like, okay, so theater people are in lower left. And like cool people and athletes are on lower right. And then if you're like really weird, you're upper left. And then there's teacher and there's upper right. And I was like, what? And then during my time there, when I would like traverse said dining halls, people were like, what are you? <laughs> and I, it, it caused me so much anxiety that people didn't, I don't know, allow me to be just a person with lots of different qualities. And so it isolated me. I was like, I guess I don't fit into any of your boxes. So I'll just hang with me. And... I don't know, I think this movie is partially my response to that experience, saying like, please stop putting people in boxes, just stop it. Just like, get over that, because you will later, in adulthood, you'll be like, Ugh, we were all everything. But for some reason, when we're young, it makes us feel safe to put people in boxes, because then we understand, and we can like feel superior in a weird way, and it goes deep, but it's a waste of time. <laughs> and it's like, watching them approach the house party, it brings back all the anxiety of like when you weren't quite invited, but you knew where it was and <laughs> could you go in and like, it was such a big moment yeah. and you guys, and you feel that. And so it's just, uh, it just brings all those memories, just rushing right back. I know. <laughs> and then they go in and everyone's lovely. And that's the thing. And that's what, something I really appreciate about the film. That they don't go in and people are like, what are you doing here? Yeah. They're like, oh my God, you guys finally are parting with us. Like there's no, there's very little shame in this movie yeah. about any of these topics that we've covered, which is fascinating. Like you guys uh, chose to rise above that in your writing and directing. And I think it's, it's something that we should commend. You come to realize like there are no bad guys in life. There's no villains. Like it, it, it's, it's easy to think about life that way because then you feel like you'll be able to see it coming. But truthfully, like everyone, is everything and I think that we wanted to take this structure that people think they understand and flip it on its back a little bit and say like but what if everyone actually turned out to be really kind and smart what does that do to how you organize society and how you think of yourself I also think on a more macro level I think a lot of times people think that comedy can't be kind like it can't be really funny and very kind or very earnest and I think it comes from the top down, and this movie's very special because Olivia's very funny and very kind, and it was a fun challenge the whole time to kind of reflect that in this tone, which I think is really specific and wonderful, and show that it can be stylish and just as funny and kind and just as funny, and that, like movies, it doesn't have to be put in that box. I'll Venmo you later. Thank you so much. <laughs> if anyone else wants to, it's Katie Silverman. <laughs> <laughs> so Molly wakes up every morning and she listens to this, uh, I don't know if it's a podcast or just like a recording, like, you are smart. Yeah. Does anyone know whose voice that is? Yeah. Maya Rudolph. Yes. Yes. I wish that was my voice. Are you kidding? <laughs> no, that's Maya. It's a fun little Easter egg. Uh, do you wake up in the morning and just uh, center yourself in a, in a similar way? 
You know what's funny? The original beginning to the movie was Molly dancing like balls out to Kendrick Lamar, <laughs> which is what I do in the morning. <laughs> um, and then we changed it to fit the character a little bit more accurately. But so my version of the motivational tape is, is Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> Katie. And now Lizzo this week. Yeah. Mine is like Lizzo in the background and Michael Barbaro in the foreground, yes. <laughs> which is the post of the daily. You should, you should listen to it. It's good. And you guys, did you choreograph the opening of the movie or was that? No, that was, so originally there was a scene where the girls were in the car on the way to school talking to one another and it was a lot of exposition. And we had kind of struggled with it thinking like we should be showing and not telling. But we shot it and we knew, we looked at each other on the truck while we were shooting and we were like, this is not staying in the movie. <laughs> um, just because we realized we needed to just illustrate their friendship in a way that was simpler and yet so much but just deeper. And so the dancing is something they would do whenever they saw each other when they got to set. And we were like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> That's it. And so we just set up the shot and told them to do what they do. And it actually goes on for like 20 minutes. Yes. <laughs> it's, and we had a version like that, which it I still really prefer. Long. <laughs> so long. Also, it's such a perfect concentration of the way that they both dance in real life. It makes me very happy. <laughs> Look out for the DVD extra. Uh, we're going to open this up to questions from you guys. If you have a question for Katie or Olivia, just raise your hand. I think we have a microphone to rush over to you, but maybe not. Oh, oh yeah, we do have a microphone in the back. Uh, right over here. Hi. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Ahmed, and happy early birthday, Olivia. Wait. I had my birthday oh. a couple months ago, but I appreciate it, because you're saying <laughs> early for next year. <laughs> Uh, was it on May 10th? Is I am Navy March 10th, oh, but I appreciate it so much. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, I had a question about Jason, your partner. Okay, I don't know. Yeah. Did, you, did he have the audition too? or? His entire relationship with me has been his audition. <laughs> Thank you. Is that it? Ahmed. Wait, can you, but can you talk about how he came to have dual roles in the film? Oh, yeah, because, oh, so, you know, it's interesting, like, a lot of good ideas come from necessity on any project, right? And in this one, once we realized we were losing days, because we, you know, the budget was not huge, and we knew we needed to cut some days in pre-production, so we were slashing the, the schedule, and we realized we were going to lose some characters and some days, and we said, we don't necessarily have enough money or time to have another actor play the Lyft driver, and so the idea came up to have Jason play both. Yes. <laughs> and we were like, that's so perfect. So we were like, why would they, the, like, playing porn in front of a stranger versus playing porn in front of their principal. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the kind of idea, like, it, it, I, I would say to any of you who are working on any project, particularly in film, like, trust that the challenges that come up might lead to your best ideas. And then you'll forget that it came from a challenge and convince yourself that you came up with it. <laughs> Any other questions? Just raise your hand. Oh, we have one up front. If somebody could run over a microphone. You could yeah. Uh, but then everybody else might not hear. <laughs> okay. Oh, here we go. He's here. Hello. Um, I love you, Olivia. <laughs> I just want you to know that I, you, I, anyway, you've been, you've been a favorite for years. Anyway, my question is, I've been so um, I'm intrigued of by the beginning of this Q&A when you mentioned that this is based on, like, of female friendships, but how you do rarely get to like, you don't know how to go through the negative parts of a yeah. friendship because it's all love and everything. And I wanted to know, um, based on like your own experiences, how were you able to manage to like deal with that difficult part? Because it's very hard because you can go years without like really like going through a negative patch. Yeah. And I just want to know how you dealt with it. Cause I mean, like I, I mean, because I need help dealing yeah, with it. Yeah, I feel you. I feel you. I, I feel like my true friends now are the people that I have, you know, gone through that fight with, gone through that experience of really hitting an impasse and getting through it, and then your relationship is solidified. I do think it's something that it gets easier as you get older when you make friends and you're very honest upfront about, listen, this isn't working for me or I'm gonna need more space in these areas or I just need you to understand I, I'm different from you in these ways. But when you're younger, it's hard because you are kind of leaning on that person, like you become one being. And 
there's comfort in that, but the danger in it is that you slowly lose your individuality. And then at one point you're like, oh God, but I want something different. How do I tell her this without breaking her heart? Yep, yep. Hi. Um, so I just want to say that like, I really, really appreciate this movie. Um, and also speaking as someone who's like queer, um, Amy's story um, isn't my own, but it does resonate. And I really appreciate that y'all, like, first of all, she had, like, affirming parents and then that, like, they were comfortable enough to, like, poke fun at how affirming they're going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the whole time I was trying to guess if, like, Amy was going to end up with anybody or, you know, what. I just, like, what was some of your, like, thought processes behind, like, those creative decisions, like. Yeah, I think we were, first of all, that's wonderful and awesome. We were really excited to uh, to tell a story, because there have been so many wonderful coming out stories in the last few years. We were really excited about the opportunity to tell kind of the story after that, and which is something that we hadn't seen as many times out there, which is like what after that, which is obviously such, such an enormous story in most people's lives, but then after that, they have a big first crush or they have their first kind of love or sexual experience and that that is as exciting a, a journey to go on and we hadn't seen that story many times. And so we were so excited to be able to show that a similar love story for both of them in terms of who they were. We, we obviously it was fun to have a twist that you, like she has a crush and a lot of times crushes don't work out and then there's someone else surprisingly waiting in the wings that way. But one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie is that love scene in the bathroom, which I think Olivia directed so brilliantly because it's all about, it's so authentic to any Hook up, which is that like the 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 difficulties and awkwardness of literally just like getting someone's shoes off on verse <laughs> make it very hard to have sex. <laughs> Can they sponsor? Us? Um, <laughs> uh, but like to approach it with that kind of authenticity, it in general, in terms of like when you're young and just in infatuated or, or is so excited about something like that, like that authenticity. And that's again, the cast that we had that was so extraordinary and was able across the board to bring so many of their own ideas there. And I think also that her, her journey is so much about uh, self-realization and just kind of like shedding of her skin in that pool scene and coming into her own that way and how that will be this valuable story that she'll be able to take with her forever. So it was a, it was a real joy to be able to tell that story with someone as wonderfully talented as Caitlin and, and Diana and all the people, and, and Victoria and everyone involved in that storyline. We also love that like Amy's not the only queer character in the movie and that it just kind of is a, a non-issue. You know, there's no real focus on George or Alan and what their relationship might be or who they're with. It's just, you know, we enjoyed the fact that we weren't putting a big spotlight on her sexuality or theirs. Um, and and I, I, get, I also give credit to the actors for just performing the hell out of those roles and just allowing it themselves to be fully dynamic and human. But I, I do think that, you know, we need to tell more stories that are about kind of the, a regular, the, about friends, a friendship where one person is, identifies one way and the other the other, and they can be so close and it's not really an issue. That was something that, that we were proud of. Um, Another thing that I'm proud of in that love scene is that I think it's a good example of people asking for consent in a non-weird, awkward, unsexy way. Like it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to stop everything, but it's like an example of how it can just like kind of still be sexy, yeah. but safe and smart. <laughs> and brave. Also oh, brave. We have time for one more question. Uh, let's, uh, right over here on the left. Hi, I love both of your work, especially like Set It Up with Katie and um, House for Olivia. That was great. Um, I wanted to know what were your favorite scenes to construct for each of you individually? I would say as a scene, my favorite scene is the scene in the pizza car. <laughs> because I think it's just like the three funniest performances and I love those hair masks so much. <laughs> And I think they're so wonderful. And I think Mike O'Brien is one of the funniest person on planet Earth, one of the funniest people on planet Earth. And, and he improvised so unbelievably in that scene. And they were so scary and funny. I really love that scene. Yeah. That, by the way, Katie came up with those hair masks. And I was like, what <laughs> genius are you? Um, my 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna name two, even though that's not really fair, but I, I just love it too much. I think um, one thing is the Barbie trip, the stop motion sequence was one that I was not going to let not happen. I was adamant that we keep this thing in there. And you can imagine the studio was like, do we need it? It's <laughs> was like, yes, we do. And it was something that was so hard to put together. It was, it was also on Olivia's original pitch deck. Like yeah. in the very beginning, she was like, I know what this movie is. <laughs> I had Barbies in my office doing all sorts of like weird, demented, real things. weird stuff. <laughs> um, but I, I just that one was one that like as an example of sticking to your guns. Like if you have an instinct about something you want to put into a story, you have that instinct for a reason. Like if it's sticking with you over months and months, and you can't imagine the story without it, really fight for it because. It, it just means it, it it matters to you in a way that is very integral to your version of the story you're telling. So that's one. Um, and then the pool scene, the pool scene was one that was a, a combination of everybody coming together to do their job so beautifully. And it was this amazing discovery. Um, you know, we didn't know what that would end up looking like. And once Caitlin got in that water and proved that somehow she knows how to act underwater with her eyes open, she couldn't see anything, but it really looks like she can see everybody. And I just remember being at the monitor thinking, this is really beautiful and this is really special and I want it to be 10 minutes long. And indeed it was at one point. <laughs> but I think that it's another example of like something that on the page... When, when, when a studio executive or producer of any kind is looking at your script and is like, well, surely this can be done in a very efficient way, they're going to look for efficiency at every turn. And you, as the filmmaker, have to defend the creative vision. You have to defend the story that might go beyond what is necessary. The same thing went for that dance fantasy sequence. That was something that people kept trying to put on the chopping block. And I was like, no. <laughs> it's really important that we see who Molly is internally. And, and the last thing I want to say about that, because a lot of you guys in here are filmmakers, is that we have to make movies that take advantage of the medium. Like, why are you making a narrative feature and not a documentary? It better be because you want to use these tools to illustrate something that can only be illustrated with the tools of cinema. Show us what's happening emotionally with these characters. Take us on a journey that is non-literal. It's just worth it, and the audience appreciates it. Um, so the dance was a version of that for me, and so was the Barbie trip, and so was the pool. But I, I can just go on and on, but I'll say the whole thing was my favorite, and <laughs> it's just really nice to show it to people and, and have people react well to it because we care very deeply about it, and just want to say thanks again. This was very, very cool for us. Yeah, this was awesome. Thank you to Katie Silverman. Thank you to Olivia Wilde. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys so much.